Okay, so tonight is the best of the edibles. So we were all supposed to think about what our favorite edibles were and find pictures of them. I have emails from four or five people. Otherwise, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people sharing screens. I expect this will probably be a popular topic tonight. So we definitely want to share the time with everyone. Um, so, so let's just share like three or three favorite mushrooms and just take a few minutes each so that everyone gets a chance to share. I'm going to start off with a couple quick announcements. I won't take up too much time doing that. Um, let's see. This Friday, the 19th, Tom Horton, he is uh, delivering a lecture at 7 p.m. on Friday night. Um, the role of soiloid fungi in conifer establishments. So that's uh, a really cool one. So it looks like it's a pretty interesting one. Um, I sent out a, a information about that um, two days ago, I believe. And I just wanted to remind everyone to look at the bottom of the email for the Taxonomy Tuesday. I just added a bunch of lectures to it. Well, not a bunch, but like two or three lectures to that. So there is some new stuff coming up. So if you haven't seen that list in a while, just refer back to that email, the Taxonomy Tuesday email, and scroll all the way down to the bottom you'll find that there. Also at the bottom of that email, there is a YouTube link. It's a little symbol, it's a little red circle with a red arrow in it. If you go to that YouTube page there, you will find recordings of all these Taxonomy Tuesdays. So if you've missed any of them, I think pretty much everyone since last October has been posted there. I think that's when I started doing it in October or November, something like that. All right, so the way this works, uh, we're gonna jump right into it tonight. The way this works is it's a show and tell type scenario where we are sharing our screen using the little green buttons down, at least on my computer, it's at the bottom of the uh, screen in the middle of the toolbar, it says share screen. And you can share your screen and show off your observations. Like I said, uh, just a couple of minutes each, there's almost 40 people here tonight. So I imagine a lot of people will have stuff to share. We um, get a queue going. So we go right in the order of people as, uh, as requested. So start typing your names into the chat if you wanna get into the, the queue of people. And like I said, I already have a few people that emailed me with some stuff, so they're ready to go. So with all of that, how do we wanna go? Anybody in the queue yet? Nobody signed up yet. So I'm gonna go right, I'm gonna start right up. with- I'm sorry? I signed up. It says Grifolo Foundosa. I, I signed up. Oh, I didn't. I didn't understand that language. You want to go, Frank? Uh, sure. You have stuff to share. <laughs> sure. Go for it. And I'm only sharing one. Okay. So, let's see how this works out. Share. And also welcome. I see there's some new people here, so I wanted to welcome them too. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this is. Um, this particular mushroom, people say, oh, you know, what's your favorite mushroom? Well, I, I say, well, not only is this one of my, my favorite mushroom, but it's also one of my favorite foods. Um, <clears throat> it has three names that's so popular. The common name is Hen of the Woods, but it also has a Latin name of uh, uh, Grifola fondosa, which is uh, pretty popular. And it also has a Japanese name it's known by, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> Maitake. So it, it uh, three names. It's, you'll see here, yeah, this is uh, a pretty general uh, just view of what it looks like size-wise. You can see the little pocket knife on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and let me move this. So there is the, uh, the fonds that you would find. Uh, it's a little blurry, but I just wanted to emphasize that this is a newer um, <clears throat> uh, uh, hen of the woods. So the color is a little bit lighter. Um, here's another hen of the woods with a, a slight variation in color, but the fonds and the general shape is the same. Um, this happens to be a, a shiitake growing out of a log. Um, and you will find the hen of the woods at the base of usually oak trees. Um, and sometimes they cluster, but it's in, usually in this notch between the, the uh, outgoing um, root structures there. And uh, surprisingly, it 
it's being cultivated by Philip Farms, which indicates that it must be uh, saprophytic. Um, and uh, I know it's, it's, that's the soft uh, spot where um, the dirt underneath here is almost like compost. It's so fine. Frank, and, I, I, yes. I, think, I think it starts as a pathogen parasite and then becomes a saprophyte. Because where I used to live in Oldwick, there was an enormous oak tree that came down and it was still growing on that tree like for another five years on the roots, you know. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with Susan. There's such a big fungus fruit body. I don't think it just grows like in a short period of time. There's a big network underneath associated with the tree probably. And it probably waits for the tree to get old or be stressed or die before it produces fruit bodies. That, I okay. mean, that's my take on it. Yeah, you know, I read in, um, I think it's in that book, uh, Mushrooms Associated with Oaks in Eastern North America. I think in there they say, they call it a mild pathogen that attacks things like, you know, older trees whose immune systems have kind of worn down. And just, they said the trees can persist for years with this mild pathogen before they die, usually something else. And then they turn into a sap root for a few years. Yeah, I, I would hypothesize also that I think it's probably um, mycorrhizal with with the tree for a great number of years before it it just goes into a different phase. You think? I agree with that. So. I find them so and, big. Yeah, I find this one tree, and every year I used to find like maybe two or three, and then one year it, they completely girdled the tree. <laughs> but um, I I must have found them that that way for years and years, and then finally. Once they girdled the tree, it only lasted for a few more years and then it died. But it was a really nice, reliable source. I could go out there early. And then even sometimes after the tree comes down, because a lot of times there's trees that are girdled like that, they go down over the winter from windfall. And the next year or two, you may still find a few on them. Like you find them on the roots that are, you know, you know, you see the big root ball or something that up in the air. I, I find them on there sometimes. Yeah, I found, I found some nice ones. Um, by a really big downed oak tree that didn't leave a lot behind other than maybe some roots and a little bit sticking above the ground uh, for about five or six years. Um, I, I kept getting one, uh, a nice one, one or, one or two, some years, two of them. Yeah, this, uh, a nice stump, a nice big oak stump will have hens all around it. So okay. somebody, somebody was asking, how do you find these old oak trees? And I don't really have a good answer to say how you actually go out and find oak trees except to just do a lot of footwork. But I will say when I'm out in the woods and I'm looking for my Takis, when I'm in those oak forests, is I, I often look up into the air and I find a big oak trees that have some sort of damage up the top, like a lightning strike or something, something that looks a little bit stressed. And those trees invariably, I find that's where I find them. All. I find a lot of them in parks, actually, in yards, people's yards. <laughs> I knock on their door. Can I pick that? Yeah, it seems like it seems like they're kind of predisposed, right? To, yeah, to open or more a little more open areas. Yeah. So what's well, the prank? Oh, I just want to say, uh, you know, uh, this year was harvested on the second week of October. Uh, not this year, but uh, last year. I mean, there's different shades of um, the hen of the woods. One, two, three, four different shades there. Um, and so I think you could find anywhere from the end of September to second week of November. That's quite a haul you have there. Yeah. Is that <laughs> it a was a good day. Is that a Russo Maria there? Um, <laughs> right, right in the right hand side, right there. Yep. Oh. Um, it could be. I'm Bacterious. not, I don't remember. Bacterius hygrophoroides. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Frank, right, cool. Oh, Frank, I have to ask you was that on Staten Island where <clears throat> this work? Uh, no, I collected in New Jersey. Okay, um, I don't need to know where because I'm not there anyway, but others might be interested. <laughs> How do you like nice specimens that? too early. You got them early before they got too big and rough. Right, right. So somebody's one asking. Thing, I'll say I was just going to read a question out of the chat. Go ahead, Sue, and then I'll read the question. Well, I just wanted to say one thing. The thing about Phillips cultivating them, it took them a long time to, um, uh, they had a lot of trouble at first with um, kind of some sort of a fungus or something attacking it. It took them a long time to get it so they could upmarket it. That is 
grow enough to have a viable crop because they kept sort of suddenly dying off. The yep. other thing I particularly like about the uh, cultivated ones, there's no waste. If you ever collected one of those out in the wild, you're picking out stones and grass, and briars or whatever is there. It envelops it as it grows. Salamanders. <laughs> so the cultivated ones are nice because there's no waste. They don't taste as good though, Sue. I, there's something. Well, I don't, I, same to me. Same to me. <laughs> but I was supposed to mention about um, you can dry them. Um, we we have dried um, hen woods and used it in uh, mushroom barley soup. It's great. And there's a recipe online called hen jerky, uh, and it is uh, it's. Uh, put on by the three four foragers. So hen jerky by the three foragers of the Connecticut Club. Um, and it is amazing, uh, like a, a jerky uh, made from hen of the woods. It's, uh, it's a good way to use some of that extra uh, hen of the woods. Yeah, if you have a lot, some good preservation techniques are um, you can saute and freeze. Um, you can cold marinate, pickle them, keep them in the refrigerator and brine. Uh, they keep a long time like that. I've kept them for over two years like that. And um, one, something I tried this year was I, I um, um, blanched some of them, put them in a food processor and chopped them up fairly finely and at, used them as a main ingredient in veggie burgers that are now in our freezer. Good. They make great mushroom soup as well. Yeah, you know, some of those pork chops. I froze them and um, I made a pork chop with a mushroom gravy with Hen of the Woods, and they were they were delicious. Yeah, that Bill Russell book, the uh, Mushrooms of Pennsylvania, <laughs> isn't that Bill Russell? He has some <laughs> recipes in the back, and he has a Hen of the Woods or maitake, like a cream of maitake soup in there. And uh, somebody at work made it and brought it in. And it was one of the best mushroom soups I've had. It was a really good recipe in that book. So, so there was a couple quick questions quick here. Question. One question from Molly was, when in parks, woods, is it okay to go off trail to look for mushrooms? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> is it okay? I, I, I guess it depends on the park or the woods that you're in. You know, some parks are yeah. so open and trampled that you know. So technically, uh, I know like in New York City, they spray along the sides of the trails, maybe up to 10 feet in to kill the uh, Japanese knotweed. So um, that's something that I know some collectors are uh, careful about. Um, and some parks allow you to pick and some places, uh, you know, that don't really appreciate your picking in the park. Um, but if it's a wooded park, um, sometimes uh, a little shop paper bag, uh, you know, those uh, shopping bags might be less conspicuous than uh, a basket. And I would also just consider where you're at. You know, if you're at the wildflower preserve, you know, you probably shouldn't be going off the trail stomping around, you know. Um, if you're out in the state game lands, you know, with, you know, thousands of acres. Yeah, you know, go wherever you want. <laughs> so, all right, so I think the next question on here was somebody said distinguish chicken of the woods from hen of the woods. So in a nutshell, the hen of the woods are the Grifola frondosa. They're the ones that the brown, grayish brown ones with all the little fronds all over them. Um, you find them at the bases of the tree and chicken of the woods is usually referred to the to those big orange brackets, which I'm sure somebody will show. And if somebody doesn't show it, remind me at the end and I'll pull a picture of one. So, so there are just two different types of polypores and both of them are good edibles. And then somebody else asked, do you cook the whole thing or just the tip? And my experience is that usually you can cook the whole thing of these. They're usually pretty nice, except for what Sue was talking about. A lot of times they're, um, the wild ones often are um, contaminated with a lot of debris and stuff like that. So as long as it's completely clean, you can eat the whole thing if you get a nice fresh one. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you should be aware of this. If you find a, a hen of the woods where there's raised black dots, 
all along the undersides usually. Um, that is typically <laughs> insect feces. And, and you want to either trim that all away really well or discard that, that part of the fruit body. Um, at least that's my opinion on that. Um, so just be aware, um, the raised black dots are, are very, very likely um, insect feces. Yeah, and usually, and too, if they're like, um, if they're full of the grit, like what like Sue was saying, and they're enveloped with the grit, I usually just pass over them. That's like a deal breaker for me when the mushrooms are all gritty and I end up with grit in my food. Um, so I guess that's everyone's personal tolerance. So somebody asked if there's any poison, poisonous lookalikes. Um, no, not any poisonous lookalikes that I can think of. There are a few lookalikes out there, but you know the mm. one that the black staining polypore people often confuse it with. Yeah, Usually, Mary Pilas Sumstinii is is edible. It's not quite as good, especially when it gets a little older. It doesn't taste very good. But I've had jerky made out of Mary Pilas, um, or Meripulus. Not really sure which way it is correct. That that was very good. Uh, that was cured in um, Thai spices and um, soy sauce. It was it was really good. All right, Kay wants to know which park spray for not weed. Uh, it, there's no way of knowing unless you actually uh, happen to be there when they're spraying. Lots of times they don't even put a sign up. Hmm. I don't know. I hear in Philadelphia that's a, uh, a thing too. I've been I've been warned to be careful in some of the parks in Philadelphia because the park service has been being trying to be aggressive about the knotweed. I was actually warned about that about actually eating knotweed itself. So, but I have no way of knowing which ones are which either. So, okay, Luke, come. Luke, how do you how do you cook the uh, graffoli? So, <laughs> so me personally, I some um, sometimes I blanch them like in salted water, and then I saute yeah. them and make tacos with them. I like them like that. Um, I've actually we have a new website coming up in JMH. <laughs> a new website being worked on is might be a couple months away but there's some good recipes on there and one of the recipes is a, a porcini and my taki ragu that I make so it's I use dried porcini mushrooms and fresh my takis and I make them into a ragu with uh, just onions and tomatoes and garlic and usually eat that over some sort of like polenta or pasta so that recipe will be available pretty soon in our new website yeah another thing I like is you can you can make if you get a graffola that's got big fronds, you know fronds that are you know two four <laughs> inches wide. Um, you can egg them and bread them and fry them and and then make them into like an eggplant parmesan kind of thing with um, uh, mozzarella and um, um, uh, tomato sauce and bake it and it, it's really good. Nice. Well, the reason I was asking was uh, a one of the chefs at Paul Smith's, he likes to take the whole thing from Phillips and plop it on a baking tray and, and roast them. I don't remember how long, but he roasts them and then he uses it in whatever dish he's using. He says that captures the flavor. You know, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I've, t I've taken, um, not the whole thing, but ripped off big hunks of it, you know, as big as my hand yep. or bigger. Uh, yeah, right. And, as big and, as his fist. And brush it down with garlic oil and put them on grills and set something heavy on, like a pan, on top of the grill. And that kind of, they, they get really caramelized and crispy. They're really good that way. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a neat way to do it, you know, because they're, like, especially if you get like a nice cultivated one. So. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Somebody's talking about muting. I forgot to mute everyone. So I'm going to mute everyone now, and then we can unmute ourselves as we need to speak because there's some background noises. So let me do that. And then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, get into some of these other, some ones that other people have shared or sent me, I mean. So I'll just do it in order that I got them as long as they're here. Let's see, who was the first one? Oh, Dave was the first one. So Dave, you ready to tell us about your three favorite edibles? And then Liz and Penny. 
Yeah, and it's really hard to pick three favorites because there's so many so many good mushrooms. But um, I I suppose you know it, it's tough to beat morels, and um, so everybody knows what morels look like. I mean, here's some of Marcella americana. Um, these were found, and and I should mention something about this. Um, these were found in um, an old apple orchard. And of course, there are warnings about old apple orchards because some of them have been treated with lead arsenate for many years, and they are basically super fun sites. Um, there are small old apple orchards around here where I live. Um, they're just little adjunct sort of things to what had been in the past, probably a dairy farm. Um, I tested the soil. I got a lead test kit. It's difficult to test for arsenic, but I tested for lead. It's not that difficult. You can get these lead test kits. I got one uh, that was easy enough to use from someplace in Canada. And um, my, the places around here came up. Okay, now there's another orchard that I have hunted. It's a great big orchard. It's probably a half a square mile at least. And I'm a little suspect of that one. I've got some morels that I've collected from that orchard set aside and I'm going to get around to testing the actual fruit bodies for lead content. But the ones from this orchard, um, they, they're okay. They, this orchard, um, it's just, a, these are just little things, two, three acres, maybe, um, you know, attached to what used to be an old dairy farm. And when the trees start to die, you get these nice big yellow morels, Marcella Americana, um, and, but once the tree dies and falls over, it's just about, that's just about it. This orchard I found in 1993 and I've been collecting there ever since, but there's only two trees left. So this is one of the last two trees. I got these nice ones by, and, um, boy, there's a lot of things I love to do with morels. I, I made a list here of um, things I like to do with morels. And, and there's other things I probably forgot. Um, can you pin down the time when I find? Well, in Pennsylvania, it, it depends on the weather. I found black morels one year, 2012, in March 23rd in, in, a, in a forest here in Northeast PA. Um, and they were out for a few days, so they probably fruited during winter, you know, technically. <laughs> so that was a real anomaly, uh, 2012. The big yellow morels, I would say anywhere between April 25th and May 15th is, is usually the best time to find them. And I think that's probably approximately true in New Jersey as well. Now, if you go to Southern New Jersey, it may be, may be a little earlier. Um, there's a lot of different kind of morels too that grow around here. There's these big yellows the, um, that, are, that are much lighter in color when they're young, the Marcella Americana. Sometimes they're gray, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're almost white. Um, usually I find these in the old apple orchards, which you have to be careful about. If you find an old apple orchard with morels in it, I would suggest you do something to determine whether um, the orchard is contaminated with lead arsenate. Um, and I find them by dying elm trees. If you know a place with a lot of elms, I, I have a one really good elm spot. It's about 40 miles from my house. I go there once or twice a year. Um, and I also find the big morels along with some of the smaller yellow ones, Marcella diminutiva, uh, and sometimes black morels, not that many of the last few years, uh, Marcella and Justiceps, um, in tulip poplar woods that, well, that used to have white ash mixed in. White ash is a really good supporter of several Marcella species, except most of the white ash are gone now. They've, they've been killed off by the um, elm, uh, I'm sorry, the um, ash uh, borer. What is it? The green? Yeah, the yeah. emerald, emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer, yeah. yeah. And that's probably why I was getting a lot of black morels for about a 10-year period, uh, because the, the ash were being killed off and the, and the 
the, the fungus was putting out a lot of mushrooms. I, um, but anyway, these big yellow ones, these were from, from app, near an app, apple tree. I get them by elm trees also. And sometimes you get the big ones in the tulip poplar forest. Um, and sometimes, who knows? You know, you just, people find them. You just find, find them in white, white pine forest sometimes. Um, do some taste better? Well, these big yellow ones are probably the best ones because there's because they're very substantial. But but you know the there are things I like the black ones for maybe better than the big yellow ones, like the black ones, which are a little less robust and not as thick fleshed. Maybe I like those a little bit better. Maybe like in a lentil soup, um, or or something like that, or or maybe even a risotto. Um, but these great big yellow ones like this, I will, I, and I dry out almost all my morels. Um, the ones that are really nice looking, I'll dry out most of them. And the ones that need to be trimmed because there's like insect damage and stuff like that, I'll, I'll slice them up and saute them and freeze. And frozen morels, I like to thaw and put on pizza. Um, I have a friend, I have a picture of a pizza here um, that I had. Uh, a person making a pizzeria, a white pizza with um, uh, mozzarella cheese, sheep's milk feta, um, sauteed garlic, and um, no, no tomato sauce, nothing against tomato sauce, but on this particular pizza, with it, which I put a bunch of morels on, but not dried ones, right? I use the, the frozen thawed ones for the pizza. It is really, really good. And the dried ones, well, you rehydrate them. And when you rehydrate dried mushrooms, the liquid that you rehydrate them in is part of the recipe. So if I rehydrate morels in half and half, maybe that's because I'm gonna make um, mushroom bread pudding. If I rehydrate dried morels in coconut milk, maybe that's because I'm gonna make some sort of curry thing. Um, but usually I'll just put dried morels in stock. Turkey stock is my favorite for morels. In my opinion, morels do not go all that well with chicken. But surprisingly, because it, you would think it's almost the same, they go really well with turkey. Um, morels go really well with some types of fish, not so much shrimp. Um, I, I like morels along with maybe either salmon or tuna. Um, morels are great with lamb chops. They're really good with pork. Um, they're, they're, you can do a lot with morels. Dried morels, there's just so much you can do with them. Um, so I dry my, my, most of mine. You don't even need to slice them up to dry them because they're, they're hollow inside. So they dry out pretty nicely, even, even if you keep them whole. And then they make like, they look nice, you know, on your mantle or whatever you know a nice big jar full of dried morels just looks really nice it's uh, people people wonder what you know what are those you know <laughs> so yeah i have a bunch of different ideas here to um to make morels um and i guess second to morels i really like king bullets king bullets a lot of different kind of king bullets boletus agilis boletus separans boletus for varieties boletus substate rulicens uh, there's there's a long list of king bullets, otherwise known as bolitas section bolitas, the ones that have the um, as as Igor would would say, it's almost like a partial veil, um, co covering the hymenium. So these are bolitas edulis. At least that's what I'm calling these. These are our local Norway spruce bolitas edulis, and I have a few different spots where I find these. Um, the um, East European immigrants um, love Bolita sedulis. Um And I, and my, my Bolita sedulis spots in the Poconos have been pretty much invaded um, by, by, by East European immigrants. And so I have to like pick my times, you know, if I can get out there like on a Thursday before the weekend shows up, you know, maybe I'll, I'll get a fair amount if, if they come out. Um, they need a lot of rain, usually rain and warmth. King bullets like rain and warmth, hot temperatures with rain. 
And um, so these are some pretty nice ones from under Norway spruce. And I, I, I think probably 98% of the bullets that I bring home, well, the king bullets, I, um, um, dry, I slice them up and dry them out. Um, they're, in my opinion, most bullets, with a few exceptions, are better dried out and rehydrated. Um, the flavor becomes more concentrated. The texture becomes a little bit uh, more favorable. At the, with, so a lot of times if you get fresh bull eats um, and cook them up fresh, they're like a little bit flabby and, and the texture is, is not the best. Now, now these ones you see here, these, these would have been just fine fresh because they're, they're really nice, tight, fresh uh, buttons that you could have sliced. I could have sliced these up and put them on the grill and baste them with um, some oil and maybe a little bit of dressing or something and salt, salt them. All wild mushrooms, in my opinion, in fact, all types of mushrooms, in my opinion, need to be salted to bring the flavor out. Um, I once read something by a, by a chef and, and this chef said that she didn't like morels. She thought they were really bland. I think it's probably because she didn't salt them. But anyway, great in risottos, shrimp risotto. Uh, Bullets are really good with shrimp, unlike morels that I don't think really blend well with shrimp. Um, Bullets go great with shrimp. In fact, I just tonight had um, um, king bullet and shrimp and spinach risotto. Uh, it was great. Um, so, so the nice thing about dried mushrooms is too, you have these jars of dried mushrooms. You, you make them when you want to make them. You know, it doesn't have to be right when you find them. You know, they're just there. They're just, you have them in your house. They're there. You say, oh, I want to make this risotto or this sauce. Oh, there's a thing I make out of King Bull Eats called um, wild mushroom, wild game mushroom sauce. I think it's called, it's a, it's a Jack Charnecki recipe. It's in Joe's book of mushroom cookery. It is a, an amazingly good recipe. And it seems really weird because you put juniper berries and dill pickles into this sauce. Well, this sauce is so good, made out of King Bull Eats. I have a friend who's a hunter. He always gets one or two deer every year. And I made the sauce for him and he grilled some uh, venison tenderloin. And he, so he tried to make the sauce himself. He went to a store and bought some button mushrooms, agaricus, but by spores. And, um, and he said, he said it just wasn't even close. So now I, I get to trade my friend dried king bullets for prime cuts of venison. And because he needs the mushrooms to make the sauce. <laughs> but anyway, um, you can make this great mushroom soup out of King Bull Eats, where the, the thing that I do is um, I use like a beef stock or a chicken stock or and um, vegetables and I puree everything. So it's like a thick pureed soup that you can add a little bit of cream to, or you can put a dollop of sour cream or, 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 or yogurt into it. Um, one thing I came up with here with King Bull Eats, I, I, I came up with this crawfish etouffee recipe that, that I, I pretty much came up with it myself because I've had crawfish etouffee in New Orleans and it does, it didn't, and it was really good. And it didn't seem anything like what any of these chefs that you see on TV make. They always make this like stew and they call it crawfish etouffee. But what I had in New Orleans was this thick, rich, dark sauce with the crawfish meat, the tails in the sauce. And that was the only actual textural difference between the sauce and the rest was the crawfish tails. So I came up with a way to, that I make crawfish etouffee. And I think it turns out really good. And, and, and you take the, the meat out of the crawfish tails and throw the rest of the carcasses into a stock pot and make this really rich stock and, and then saute your vegetables and, and rehydrate your mushrooms in the, in the stock, put everything into a blender and puree it. And that's, and that's what I, that's how I make crawfish etouffee. And I use, of course, a roux, you know, any kind of New Orleans cooking, there's probably going to be like a roux involved. 
Um, and it, I'll tell you what, it comes out really good, and it is pretty darn close to what I had in New Orleans. Armillaria. I, lo I love Armillaria. The Armillaria, which I call Popinkies in my um, locale, that's a um, perversion of a Polish word. Um, I Some people don't like Armillaria because they, they tend to be a little bit slimy. Uh, some people get sick on Armillaria. You have to be aware of that. Some people are allergic, pretty badly allergic to a substance found, you know, that's present in armillaria. My opinion is, and I don't have data to back this up, except, well, this is my data set. Okay. I know three people who got really sick on armillaria. Two of them personally very well. And a third was just a person who I met at a mushroom um, uh, event. And in all three cases, the mushrooms were not parboiled. And the old timers here around where I live, the old immigrants who came, you know, first, second generation, they always parboiled our malaria. And I think that's probably the reason why. Um, and then you cook them very slowly, even after that. If you saute them, on fairly low heat, low to low moderate heat after they're parboiled with some onions and eventually put some garlic in too, if you like. You do it slowly and you cover the skillet for about 15 minutes and you know shove them around once in a while, scrape the pan. And that helps reduce the, the slime. Um, but I really like armillaria. They're a great mushroom to have alongside a beef steak or a pot roast. Um, there's, there are all there's these like different versions of these traditional soups that they make around here. I just saw someone put in the chat here about Russians like them. Yes, in, in Russian, they are ipieta. And I know that because I used to collect, um, when I was a graduate student, I collected with, um, a Russian graduate student, um, who was really, well, all, <laughs> all Russians are really into mushrooms. Um, but ipieta and popinki. Well, the word popinki is probably close to what the Polish word is. I, I'm not sure it's exactly accurate, but um, um, what else do I like to do with these? Oh, they're great in beef stroganoff. I put them into um, Asian stir fries that have like, okay, I really like them in um, uh, chicken, broccoli, and garlic sauce. They go really well in that. Um, but I, but I like them best. I, I really very simple, mm -hmm. a grilled beef steak, good quality beef steak, like a porterhouse or something, you know, with some of these sauteed on the side with onions and garlic is really good. So yeah, these... so I've, I've got a bunch of, I've got so many honorable mentions of mushrooms that I like. There's <laughs> other people will probably hit yeah. upon them. So, so, uh, Tamora's asking, where do these grow? So usually like on hardwoods, dead hardwoods, dying hardwoods in the woods. Yeah, hardwoods too. I find them on pine also. And I found some one year I found on spruce. So what species is that? Isn't that um, an obligate species to conifers? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. The oh, ones gonna... here I think are Armillaria gallica. And the yeah. way I tell gallica is they have the stringy partial veil as opposed to the membranous partial veil that you would usually see in Malia. Um, and Gallic is always on Gallica the ground. Gallic tends, it? a lot of times tends to grow, seem, seems to be terrestrial, but it's growing from roots. Uh, but then there's other ones too. See the stringy partial veil there? Mm -hmm. right? That's a Gallica um, trait. Then there's ringless honey mushrooms also. Ring, which is actually genus Desarmillaria now. Desarmillaria tabescens. It's probably a group. There's probably several species housed in that, um, under that name, Desarmillaria tabis. Those, those are a little harder to identify because they don't have the partial veil. Um, in fact, a lot of the old timers around here would not, they probably would not pick Desarmillaria because they would not recognize it as a popinky because of the lack of partial veil. Um, there's, there's a few other species too. Malia is pretty common. Malia usually comes out first. You'll find Malia 
typically in oak woods, um, late August through a good part of September. Um, but it's but there's no hard set rules on when and where each, each one comes out. Uh, these were picked. These were found in my um, my mother's yard, like where I grew up in Wilkesbury. There used to be some peach trees on the adjoining property and they were cut down a number of years ago. So there's like all these roots under the ground. And, um, and I think that's probably the reason why these things are growing now. Um, all right, cool. Well, Thanks, also, you know, another thing that they're good in, they're, the, these are really good in um, chicken cacciatore. Um, okay, that's enough. I just I, I say one little thing about the armillaria, and um, I was coming out of the woods kind of a um, little bit past dusk, and there was an old oak tree that had been down by honey mushrooms. You could see all the rhizomorphs in there. You know, I, I knew it from that, but it actually was glowing green like kryptonite. It had fox fire. It was the most impressive thing I think I ever saw. It was, oh. like, it was the oddest thing because you're like, what's going on there? But uh, it was pretty cool. And I, I just want to say the, uh, the common terminology for armillaria is honey mushrooms. So you, you could group the um, all three species into a general group of honeys. Honey yeah, mushrooms. there's actually, Tom Volk has actually identified, I don't know, 17 species in North America. I mean, some of them only grow out West. Um, but yeah, the reason why they're called honey mushrooms is not because they taste like honey. It's because of the color on the cap exhibits the variability of the color of honey. Golden yellow through dark amber and sometimes very dark. So that's the reason why they're called honey mushrooms. I, I saw a pretty uh, interesting and funny uh, video on, on cooking honey mushrooms, uh, which the guy called Stumpies, apparently at parts of America, they're called Stumpies. Um, and he uh, said, he warned, he was sauteing his, and he warned that they pop very high if you saute them. Uh, and he, of course, he also said to saute them for a very long time, like, like you did, Dave, that you have to be careful to cook them long enough. But he recommended, he said sometimes they jump out of the pan so high they can hit you in the eye. So he used a, uh, a clear cover over that between his face and the, and the pan as he was cooking them to keep them from popping up and hitting him in the eye. It was hilarious. <laughs> you could get one of those like face shields that people wear these days. <laughs> yeah, probably a face shield would work too. <laughs> so, all right, let's move on to Liz. Liz Broderick, are you there? I'm right there. Yeah, and these, can you blow that up, Luke? Yeah. I don't usually post my edible things on Mushroom Observer or by Naturalist because you get way too much interest. But um, these, we've talked about these. These are the king bolates, the Boletus edulis. And I find them mostly under um, white pine and sometimes Norway spruce. I have a few places I can find them. And with the really little, like the little bouchons, the tiny buttons, I like to slice them really thin with a mandolin and make a salad, just pour it raw olive oil and a little salt and pepper over them. And they're really good. I know I don't usually eat raw mushrooms, but that's one that's just an exception. And when they're little and they still have the, the white pores, I cook with them. I do a lot more things. Once the pores get greenish like that, I usually dry them and I find they're much, much better dried and they, they're wonderful in risottos. Um, the kind of older ones, I usually pulverize with a grinder and make a powder. And that's wonderful to throw in soups, but I've also used it um, on um, steaks. When I grill steaks, I use that uh, with a little bit of salt and it makes like a caramelized coating on it. It's delicious. And uh, it's good on popcorn when you pulverize it like that too. You can just kind of throw it on popcorn. So this is probably my all time favorite. I love it. Nice. But, all right. Okay. 
And we've talked about some of these others already. So, okay, there you go. There's some more, yep. And you can see the, um, the real young ones have a white pore surface and the older ones, you can see the green. And this was after a rain, you can see they're all, all dirty, but they wash up pretty well. I wasn't leaving those. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> they were. All right. I think I sent cool. some morels too, but we've talked a little about morels. I have to say one more thing about honey mushrooms. We had a stump in our, our very first house in the backyard, an old um, oak tree that had died. And there was just every year a prolific fruiting of, um, I think they were malia, but I don't fry many things, but we fried them, just made like a tempura batter and fried them and uh, they were just delicious. That's worth frying, but I think you're right. They have to be very thoroughly cooked. Hmm. I don't see your morel pictures. Okay, well, oh, wait, wait, okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's buried in there. We've seen some other pictures. Ah, there you go. There you go. Oh, cool. oh, good, because these look like they might be a different species, maybe. Yeah, these actually were found, um, I think this is the little tulip. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. I was going to say, it looks like the tulip mushroom. That's, that's yeah. what I was, yeah, oh. especially this one. Yeah, the longer, skinnier. This, this is like the classic, like, tulip uh, poplar uh, morel, the way I always associate them, that really thin and tall. Mm -hmm. And they're actually, I, my favorite thing to do with them is to take asparagus in spring and ramps if you can get them, otherwise just, you know, scallions and make um, an omelet or a frittata with them. They're delicious. And yeah, yeah or a, um, uh, a quiche. I make quiche with oh, the yeah. same ingredients you're saying. Yeah, the same kind of a thing. The other mm -hmm. thing, that good old Joe's Mushroom Cookery Cookbook has a recipe in there that he does like a pasta primavera but he uses um, radiatory pasta that look kind of like little morels, so it complements them. And you just slice them across, so they look like little radiatory. And I do that like a pasta primavera, and I do put a little bit of, I, uh, maybe half and half in there, along with the stock to um, extend it. And that's delicious. And again, I do it with spring vegetables, but I dry it, most of them really, because they're great all year long. I make great chicken marsala. And uh, I, I do like them with chicken. I know you were saying you didn't, but it, it's- I, I can see with, with chicken marsala because the wine sauce would combine well with, with the flavor, I think. They're delicious. I have to say occasionally, like um, my one daughter lives up in Flemington and there's a market up there that sells uh, morels and they're fresh, but they're kind of dry and I'm, they're burned morels. You can tell by looking at them. And occasionally I bought them up there just because I wanted to try them and they were gritty. I, I thought, oh, no way I'm ever doing that again because for that price, you know, they weren't cheap and they weren't good. They were nothing compared to what we get just locally. Yeah, the, the barn morels a lot of times will have the, um, they'll have ashy sort of deposits on them. Yeah, oh, they were just And that is why some recipes will tell you to rehydrate morels and then discard the liquid. That's because that a lot of people are using barn morels. So and I, you, you know what? Even if even if you're using barn morels, though, if you just let that liquid settle and discard the sediment that sinks to the bottom, yeah, but you, you run into a coffee filter. That's what I do. Oh, okay. uh, that's a good thing to do because I because I use a lot of dried morels in my bit, you know work and. They, they're, they're all burned morels. The ones you buy commercially, they're dried. And mm -hmm. That's exactly what I do. I run into a coffee filter. What do you call the, what's the Latin for the tulip poplar morels? Two Dominion. species. Dominion. Marcella diminutiva. Yeah. Marcella, I think it's Skeptriformis, something along those lines. They're, 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 they're cryptic. They're, they're like almost impossible to separate by the eye. Skeptriformis tends to have a little bit more southern distribution than diminutiva. At least that is the, my understanding, the most current um, under, um, classification of, of, of the small um, forest morels in the in eastern United States. There's different ones out west. Okay, I can move on so somebody else gets a chance to talk, but they're fun to find. All right, thanks, Liz. 
Sure. So somebody asked about um, lookalikes for honey mushrooms. Um, that's probably way beyond the scope of this tonight. You could spend the rest of the night talking about that. So somebody I, did. I, I, I posted in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I was going to tell them that, that it's posted in there. But I will just say about um, honey mushrooms, my opinion is that's one you should really take slow. That's, honey mushrooms take a little while to learn because there's so many things that you could confuse them with that are potentially are poisonous. And remember, they have a white spore print as opposed to the gallerina with a, a brown spore print, or a, a rusty brown spore print. So, uh, so I forgot to mention the gallerina. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's, Rust, rusty so brown. Just, yep. just generally speaking, honey mushrooms are one you probably want to take take your time learning them. You know, you don't have to eat them the first year you find them. So. All right. This is Penny, right? I thought that people would talk about my favorites, which are morels and chanterelles. So I thought I'd pick some other ones. So um, this is hiddenum, I think umbilicatum because it's smaller and maybe you could see a depressed stalk. Um, also known as hedgehogs because they have the spiky pore surface. And uh, I don't find a whole lot, but when I do, I get really excited because I think they're delicious and uh, I just do a simple saute when I when I cook them with some, you know, um, garlic and onions. Yeah, yeah, these are really good. I guess um, for umbilicatum, I think you have to see the top of them. That, aren't they the ones right. that have like yeah, a little- Yeah, they have a belly button. A belly do, I button. Have a, do I have another picture in there? No, uh, well, this one, there's only two pictures. Oh, really? Maybe okay. somewhere else. Oh, there we go. Looks like there's another, it came separately. There you go. Yeah, they sort of are depressed in the center. Yeah, usually, usually pretty small. And I, I usually find what I call umbilicatum. And I, I believe that's one of the few old names that has survived the, the onslaught of DNA uh, analysis. Um, but I usually find them in coniferous areas. Yeah, they, they, I found them with hemlocks. Hemlocks, now, yeah, hemlocks. Pines I also. I, I didn't know whether they were umbilicatum or repantum, but they were smaller, so I, that's what I thought, and the depressed center a little bit. What's traditionally called repantum is quite a lot bigger. Right. Umbilicatum is uh, described by Peck from, uh, actually, you're the one that lives or has a place in Keene, right? Right. Down towards um, below Ticonderoga. What's the next town? Hague, Hague. That's where his original type collection is from. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at this photograph too, you can tell they are pretty small because those are uh, with the, uh, the yellow fish, the little shank yeah. with them. Yeah, it's the same area where I find the yellow foot uh, in the hemlocks. Yeah, uh, yeah so nice, they are kind of small. You had a nice dinner there. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> just put them all together. Yeah. <laughs> I think they taste a little bit like chanterelles too. They have that apricotty taste to them, the ones I find anyway. They, they are related to chanterelles, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, they are pretty closely related. Oh, I didn't know that. And oh, some, yes. sometimes you get fooled if you see them from the top uh, because they're both meat, kind of meaty. You get fooled that uh, one way or the other. Yeah, cantharellus is now in, the, in that family, Hidnaceae. Oh wow! I didn't know that. You know they kind of have the same, the similar texture too, don't they? Like when you pick yeah. them up. Yeah, there's they, they cook up similarly. I like hiding them with fish. Yeah, you know I've I've heard that that that's kind of a classical uh, combination. I don't know. I don't, I don't I like find trout. Rich. I like them with trout. Um, what else? Maybe um, maybe like tilapia. Whatever you would cook chanterelles with. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I like chanterelles with tilapia and trout also. <laughs> so, so I guess that's, that's I agree with. There you go. <laughs> All right, what else do you have, Penny? So I have uh, lobster or hypo, hypomyces lactiflorum, which are uh, a uh, fungus that attack uh, lactarius and russula species. And uh, so I think there's a couple of other pictures, but um, you can sort of see the gills of the mushroom that 
uh, well, this one, you can't see very many gills, but the yeah, one before right. you see the outline of the gills. And uh, uh, they're exciting to find because they're, they're so bright red. And I, I don't know, I think, I don't know what the white is that I cooked them up with, but um, I just cooked them in butter and the, the butter takes, takes on the color of the lobsters. So they're pretty good. And then you can put them on rice or pasta. Um, but yeah, the texture is, is, is very meaty and sort of crunchy. And the texture is, is, is very good. The flavor is mild. So you have to be careful not to, uh, mix them with something where the flavor will get lost. The best recipe I found was one online where they roasted them. They, they left pretty large pieces and pan roasted with butter and oil and then uh, put it in the oven and roasted for like uh, 10 to 15 minutes at 350. And it, it was delicious. So that, that's what I thought was the best. It, it, it seems like um, yeah, they do have that texture, that crispy texture. It seems like a long, slow cooking, like the way you would cook a lactarius would be the way to go. Okay. I actually, lactarius, I actually read that in the Bissette's book. They actually recommend cooking them slowly to, to make that, uh, that granular texture go away. And I tried it and it works pretty good. So when do you find these? Where? No, when? When? In the, I guess midsummer. And, uh, uh, in a, in are you in New Jersey or in the Adirondacks? In the Adirondacks, I, yeah, I, that's what I thought. Yeah, they're much more. I never find there. them in New Jersey, even in Stokes. I've never found them here, but we you find haven't? them. No, but up by Lake George, we find them. But I've never found them down this way. Yeah, I, I get quite a few of them in Pennsylvania. Usually hemlock woods. A place in New in uh, New Jersey near Chester, on the way to Meadow Woods. For a few years in a row, I would go that way, and they were all over this guy's front lawn. Oh, cool, they're beautiful. Yeah, they are. They make good dyers too when they're past their prime for eating. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, well, that, oh, yeah, I can see them. that because they—that's one of the fun ways of why cooking them with rice or pasta or making a pasta sauce because it gives it a nice color. I know Chris Dara, who has mainly mushrooms, he's given me some old old rotters that are no good anymore, but they make a pretty dye. What color is the dye? It depends on the um, pH. warden that you use. Uh, it, yeah, it's like a peachy pink. Yeah. The ones I, yeah, more pink for me than peachy, but it was not the red that the semi-sanguineous make. If you add the and, ammonia to change the pH to about nine, you will get a deeper orangey red. Oh, I wish I'd known that, Sue. Okay. Well, and also the quantity of how much you use to proportion of the yarn matters. But I, well, I, I didn't have enough mushroom for the amount of yarn that I used. Yeah. I think that was the other issue. But it was still a really pretty, like a, um, not yeah, a dark peach, peach, but a light peachy, light pink. Peach. The other thing is, is if you're using them, make sure you peel off the outside and get rid of the white inside. You, you'll. Yeah, I didn't do that. I found that out later dye too. Stuff. <laughs> well, oh, I'm really? just. So the, you know. so the so the dye is really the uh, the hypomyces. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. The the Russell Chris's of, wife told me later. Patty told, told so me about to do that after the fact. All right. What else are we looking at? So Patty? this is a Lactarius thyenus. It's orange with an orange uh, latex and no green, which di which distinguishes it from the Deliciosa. And uh, I, I, this one is just a favorite of mine because it was the first Lactarius I ever found. And, uh, it, and it, I cooked it up with some, um, the pear-shaped puff balls, so lycoperdin piriformi. And it was just delicious. I just sauteed it in the pan. And okay. it, has a, it has the nice uh, uh, firmer texture uh, that I guess Lactarius have. What kind of Lactarius is this? It's thyenus. T -H oh, Thynos. T -H -Y -I -N -O -S. And this is also from the Adirondacks, right? From the Adirondacks. Yeah. They're real common up here all summer long. Yeah, also in Vermont. And I, I like them as well. I think they're good. 
I, I think they're underestimated. I think I've seen them at Turkey Swamp in New Jersey, actually. I don't think you need to wash out the latex. Uh, and they call it latex, but it's not like a chemical latex. It's just uh, that's part zettable too, so you don't have to wash it out. Yeah, uh, you don't need to drain the latex on. Yeah, I don't. I say I don't know how you would really wash it out without ruining yeah. it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, out of all the different like carries I eat, I never just cook them. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Penny. All right, is Dorothy with us tonight? I haven't heard her at all. Dorothy Smallland? Well, let's look at her pictures anyway. <laughs> so she had a chicken of the woods. This one looks like it's probably got white pores on it, doesn't it? Although this is growing, you know, this is interesting. This looks like it has white pores on it, but it's growing. It looks like it's growing on a, uh, a downed log, which is an abnormal growth form for that. So this normally you would call this Cincinnatus, right? There's an undescribed uh, white gonna, pore species that uh, grows you, directly on wood. You beat me to it, Dave. I was, that's what I'm leading with. <laughs> yeah, I think this might be that undescribed species that we uh, hear about. The white poured mushroom, chicken mushroom that grows on the. Uh, That's on probably why she put it in here. Yeah, it's uncommon in my experience. Yeah, I think it's yeah. I've not seen much of this either, but huh. it's cool that she has a picture of that. It, it's it's an oak thing as an well. Oak on I oaks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a Grifola frondosa, another hen of the woods so somebody that was asking a little earlier to differentiate between a chicken and a hen they're pretty obvious when you're looking at the differences this is what they call the hen of the woods that's what they call the chicken of the woods chicken of the woods being a couple of different species uh, somebody's asking to clarify what's abnormal about that we're just it's the growth pat the growth habit it's growing on an unusual spot and it's making us think that it's probably an undescribed species well it's it's the growth pattern plus what we're assuming is a white hymenium, a, a white underside, because the yellow poured ones, right, the spurious, one there. almost that? always grows on wood, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, there you go. So if you look at this one, this one's growing in like a shelving fashion, and you can tell by the, the yellowing edges here, but see where it's growing on the wood? And then this one is growing in a similar shelving pattern, but with white and growing on the wood, whereas Cincinnatus grows typically in a rosette form out of the buttress roots of trees. So they would be found on the ground or at the very, very base of a tree. So what's interesting about these mushrooms is a lot of them are really um, specific about where at on the tree that they will grow. So I've heard that, uh, well, I I ate uh, chicken in the woods once and I got lip tingling and um, I've heard discussion about whether that's a, a reaction to um, the, the mushroom itself or, or is that a certain variety that can cause that more likely or the kind of wood that it grows on, but uh, I've never had it again, so I don't know. <laughs> I have heard that some several people have that reaction. I have a very much worse reaction than that. It is violent. And I tried it three times. Third time, that was it. No more chicken for me. What's your reaction? Um, hours later, like middle of the night, just everything. Every, every orifice. Mm, okay. Nasty. <laughs> Okay. So no more that, chicken. Okay. So that's a really good point there that we should clarify about eating edible mushrooms is you should really always try a very small amount first to make sure that you can tolerate it. I actually have like that um, what Jaroporus um, castanius. That's really commonly eaten, but every time I eat it, I, I feel really queasy from it. I think it's something that I don't personally tolerate. So um, you know what, Luke, I've had trouble with Jaroporus castanius also. Yeah, but you know, people consider it a really good edible, right? I think it's yeah. delicious. I've had it a couple times. And yeah. So, 
so That's my compensation for not being able to eat uh, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So anyway, the point the point being is that when you're trying a new mushroom, you should really just try a small amount first. Make sure you really are intolerate it. You know, and give it a day. And, and save some people, in the fridge, uncooked. And for yeah. the new people, it's called chicken because after you cook it, it has the texture of chicken. Just a little detail. Yeah. Cool. Somebody asked there... in the chat too if whether you can eat that chicken of the woods with alcohol, and I don't think there's any problem with it. I think it's fine with alcohol. Yeah, I've never heard of any uh, any um, problems there either. I think some people are just sensitive to it. Yeah. Um, there are some reports that say you have to be careful. Um, specifically with the species that grows on coniferous wood, and it really looks an awful lot like the one that grows on, um, well, the yellow poured one that grows on hardwood. So that's um, Huronensis? Yeah, it's Huronensis, I think. You, do you ever yeah. actually find that, Dave? I found it, but I don't find it around here. I okay. found it in the Catskills. Yeah, because I, I always look for it, but I've yet to ever see that in New Jersey or southeastern Pennsylvania. But Huronensis is Lake Huron, so it's not that far from us. And the alcohol problem is with uh, Caprinus or something, isn't it? Yeah, but there's, you always hear stories about some people just reacting badly. You often, you hear, I've heard of people talk about honey mushrooms and alcohol having really bad reactions. And, Mor morels and, also. Morels. They're, you're right, that Caprinus mushroom, that's actually got something in it that it, I think causes an inhibition of the enzymes in your stomach that uh, digest alcohol. Coprinus ultramentarius, I think it is, or I yeah. might be close, at least in the ballpark. So, They've so actually is, synthesized yeah. a chemical from that that they use to treat hardcore alcoholics. Yeah, it's called antabuse because it, it inhibits the ability to, to uh, at all metabolize the alcohol. So you, you get a huge... Uh, reaction to it hmm. all right cool well thanks dorothy <laughs> west question about the chicken uh yes. how do you determine the age of the chicken because uh the older specimens they tend to have a uh, uh, harder flesh i do a bite test in the woods i break a piece off and i take a bite of it and if it tastes if the textures and i spit it out and uh if the texture is unpleasant to me in the woods i don't bother taking it if it's nice and soft like a fresh mushroom then i'll take it with me okay i see and I, I've found that no amount of cooking will ever fix a chicken that's over the hill. I've boiled and boiled them for hours at a time, gerate them and pass them through strainers and you can just never get rid of that cardboardiness in there. Mm -hmm. But they have something to do with the hyphae, the structure of the hyphae. Mm -hmm. So say, say the, the specimen is pretty old, right? You, you can still take uh, some margin out of that specimen, right? How do you figure, I guess, the width of that margin? You just gotta feel it. Just comes with practice. Mm -hmm. If your knife cuts through it easily, then it's okay. Yeah, and you know, you know, you know, and I see people out there cutting stuff that I would, I personally would never eat, and they're happy with it. And if they're happy with it and they're tolerating it, it's not causing indigestion. You know, that's fine. You know, it just comes with like practice and personal preference. So. Is there any value in uh, turning the the older, uh, harder flesh into powder for seasoning? guess if you like the flavor of it like that but I would also be mindful of the anatomical uh, the, the, the the structure of that see these those are polypores and I think they're dimetic polypores but I think they do develop like skeletal hyphae and that skeletal hyphae is going to be really really hard and yeah that could really cause some indigestion in some people and that's what's not cooking when you're trying to cook it the skeletal hyphae once it hardens it never softens back up. That's what gives the polypores their hard structures. They're like firm structures and keeps them, makes them persist for so long is the fact that their hyphae like really solidify really hard and don't degrade, if that makes sense. Yeah. I would just be a little bit mindful of that, but I don't know. I also, you know, with things like that, you know, I'll experiment a little bit with that. You know, if I don't tolerate, I'll eat just a little bit of it and if I tolerate it, I'll go for it and 
if I don't tolerate it, you know, well, hopefully I didn't eat too much of it. I will say chicken of the woods has actually made me sick before from overindulging from pigging out on it. I've woken up with like, you know, some pretty, you know, some cramping and stuff like that from just having too much of it. And I think that was strictly, you know, overindulgence. It does make good little um, chicken nuggets, I have to say. I've done that for the kids and they really love it. Yeah, you know, I'll say chicken of the woods is one of my favorites. It's a, that's a really good, that's a really good mushroom. So, all right, I think we're, we're going to be coming back around to chicken of the woods in a little bit. So, um, Sue, you want to tell us about your tasty treats? Well, um, this is my second favorite here, the uh, chanterelle. This is from up here in the Adirondacks, but I used to find something, the smooth no gill want form down in New Jersey. But to me, this is the tastiest thing. If you can find them when they're not too buggy, as I remember, this was a pretty good collection. Um, yeah, it's just my favorite, nice, light, delicate. And I have to say with all of these, I like um, them with chicken and I like it with brown rice and I make a little cream sauce, light cream. If you've got it, white wine, learned that from Jim Richards and Bob Hosh years ago, but I never have it on hand. But anyway, um, these are really good. I would not dry these. They don't reconstitute well. Uh, they get too rubbery, not a good texture. But anyway, um, so this is my second favorite. Um, you can show the next one, Luke. Right, this is my third favorite which is the, I call this Hiddenham Rapandum. Um, they were about the size of my hand, fist. Well, this was from the Adirondacks. Now, I've seen them this big in Connecticut, but I don't remember ever seeing these in New Jersey this big. And this now some years ago, but they're pretty easy to recognize. What, what kind of woods do you find these really big ones in? I usually get them in beech woods. You know, I don't remember in this particular instance, except that I think it was very mixed. It probably had oak beech and a lot of conifers um, in central Adir Adirondacks here. Uh, these were around the first week of September in this particular spot. Yeah, and this is another name, hedgehog. A lot of things get called hedgehog, but there was a, a, a grad student of Brandon Matheny's a few years ago who was trying to straighten out the hiddenums, particularly the umbilicatum, but um, these are pretty distinct when you do see them this big. And luckily, because it was uh, started to be cool up here, they weren't buggy at all. Yeah, yeah, usually I find them without bugs in them and usually around the same time of the year, September. Yeah. And they get really big. You can you can find six, seven inch wide caps. As soon yeah. as it starts to cool down, cool nights a few. When we found a, a, a big fruiting in Connecticut on one of the coma forays, uh, in central Connecticut, it was about the third week of Connecticut. So I, I don't know if you know this is well worth knowing if you can find it. Yeah, you can see how big these are. I mean, that's a full-size yeah, yeah. paring knife, right? That's a little paring knife, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, that's a nice find there. Yeah. Sure. All right, and I take yeah. it that's your favorite? <laughs> yeah, morels have always been my favorite. When I was in New Jersey for years and years, I used to take a week off to hunt morels in May. Usually uh, they would peak about uh, Mother's Day. And I'll just say Hunterdon and Sussex County under dead elm trees. Um, and the tree has to be only just recently dead. It has to still have the bark on it, but be dead. Uh, if, if there's no bark on the tree, the morels are gone, they're done. You won't find them. This is actually from Saranac Lake um, about 10 years ago. And I just liked it because of the cluster. Ah, but yeah, I, I, well, if you find enough, my best pictures, or 20 years ago before I had digital. So it would be hard, I would be hard pressed to really show you that unless I scan them or something. But yeah, uh, I will say one thing that if you dry them at too high a temperature, you'll, you'll dry out the flavor, um, not above 110. And even that's probably a little high. Um, 
I used to, when I was in New Jersey, have a gas stove that had pilot lights, two little pilot lights. And I used to put a screen across the top of the stove and, and cut them in half because you want to make sure there's no bugs, slugs, ants, nests, whatever. Um, brush out the pits a little bit if you need to. Put them up to a, a, a light to make sure there's nobody inside the pits. And uh, they'll take about 24 hours to dry, depending on how wet they are when you pick them. Um, anyway, and this is yet another one that I just particularly like to fry them just by themselves, butter and oil a little bit and salt and pepper or with a little cream if you have it um, over chicken and rice. Um, if you know, you at the, at the uh, I think it was the NAMA foray at Paul Smith's a couple years ago. Uh, did you that was just that? 2019, yeah. And they had a, uh, a the uh, restaurant school there had a mushroom dinner and oh, which yeah. we went to and they had some morels in the recipe and I, on, the, on the menu and I, I thought they were tasteless. And so I don't, I don't know whether they dried, maybe they dried them too long. I was, I was thinking, well, maybe they rehydrated them and then used the liquid somewhere else. And, but I just, I was very surprised. They, they didn't have much taste. Yeah, it's, it, it could be that they were dried for, for way too long or the fact that um, they were dried at too high a temperature. Mm. Interesting. Can be the case. I don't remember where Kevin got them because I was involved with the uh, supplying of mushrooms, but I don't remember giving him any morels because I'm not that generous with morels because I don't find them up here anymore. I mean, I don't find Well, well that was a separate event, so. I, oh, I, I know what it was. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. All. It, it was the school there, 30 people. Maybe. It was a very cool event. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin offered that. And, well, Long there. story, I've had something to do with it. So, so you don't find a lot of morels up there in your area? No, no, so, not at all. Okay. No. These there were there, are, there are cultivated morels now. Yeah. And Phillips, what yeah. I've heard is that they they don't taste as good. Ma, I was given for Christmas a present of uh, morel uh, spawn. So I'll have to see how that works out. They're it, it, not easy to grow, but you okay. I'll just say years ago, um, New Jersey used to be crisscrossed with um, railroad lines in Sussex, Warren, Morris, Hunterdon counties. And um, those were abandoned over a hundred years ago. And that's where the elm trees grew up along the old railroad lines. Some of you are, you're way too young to remember Greta Turchik who was the Morel queen used to find thousands in the spring. And some of us caught on to the fact of where she lived and lo started looking on a map to see where she was finding these. And I would say from about 1985 till I left in 2000, well, 2000, they st the, the trees were pretty much gone by about 2004 or five. Um, there's just no elm trees at all along the railroad lines. But they used to be very easy to find in a very narrow window from about 25th of April, as Dave said, to about the 15th or 20th of May. So Luis is asking how you actually clean them. I guess with a brush, right? Yeah, I cut off the bottom. And if you're, with this, I don't think I ever even took the bottom because you knew what they were. So less dirt is less cleaning later. But when you get, and the worst thing in the woods is to find cut stems. <laughs> Somebody's been there before you, It's not a private spot. Um, but then I would cut them in half. And I'll tell you another thing that I always do with morels, even uh, when I found them up here, I bring them home and lay them out single layer in a tray and leave them for a couple of hours just to dry off the surface moisture. And then when I sit down and work with them, I cut them in half lengthwise. And as I said, they're completely hollow, but you, I put them up to a light, like a candle kind of thing, you know, a little lamp and, and literally use a, 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 a little brush to brush out stuff and brush them uh, on the inside, whether I'm gonna cook them right away or whether I'm gonna dry them. I have a food dehydrator, a, a Excalibur that I've had for years and years and um, they dry very easily that way. What kind of trees do you find them with in the Adirondacks? 
In the Adirondacks rare, we have one spot here in Saranac Lake and it's ash. And to tell you the truth, until somebody in Syracuse took me into an ash woods where you could see them 20 feet away, um, I had never really found a lot except in Princeton at your still Morel site in the spring, the Princeton Waterworks, I assume you still go there, right? Yeah, I think they, I think we do, but uh, those are with tulip trees, right? Well, there's mostly tulips in there, but if you, if you pay attention to where you actually pick your morel, there are still a few big ash trees in there. So I, I never was quite sure which tree it was. Well, it's both. And, yeah, it's, it's and both. So there's several species of morels in there um, all about the same time. Unfortunately, down here in this region, that Princeton, greater Philadelphia area, all those big ash trees are, you know, they're getting oh, harder and harder to find. Emerald ash borer has decimated them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. Just say that this year we're not going to do the Princeton parade, oh. um, just because it attracts so many people, and Nina didn't feel it was going to be safe to well, have a parade there. So. I you could just, on your this picture here is from the Princeton Waterworks foray in 2006, I think. I think you all know who he is, but um, yeah, the. The, the thing about Princeton is everybody knows about it, but it's a good introduction, even if you find what John is holding in his hand, for people who are new to be able to see one at all. And if it's a good year, you know, a few people have little handfuls, four or five, enough to cook them up themselves to take them, because then you'll remember why you want to learn them and hunt them. Um, uh, that's too bad, because there's no place else really that's sort of public that you can take any kind of a crowd and be sure you're gonna find some morels. A couple of years ago, we found, uh, I think 108 and some of them were the little diminutiva, but um, one guy found some, some pretty decent size. He said he found them under conifer. There aren't that many conifer there, but. Yeah, there are way in the back, way, way, way. I remember a stand of white pines in the back, but yeah. then I've also said there's some big ashes in there too. Anyway. All right, cool. Well, oh, thanks, Susan. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, Luke, the one thing I was going to say, do you know the story of Bob uh, Peabody and the um, heavy metal? Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard it, and I think I, I read that paper on it, too. Uh, you know, people should know about that, in that Bob was a member oh. of the club for many, many years, but when he used to hunt morels and probably the 60s, maybe early 70s. He hunted exclusively under apple trees, old apple apple orchards, which again would have been in Hunterdon and um, Warren counties. And um, he developed, well, I guess it was around 2005, uh, took a lot of diagnosis to figure out what was the matter with him, but it was decided it was heavy metal poisoning. Um, he was lose, he had gone on a diet to lose a lot of weight and the uh, heavy metals apparently accumulated in his fat cells. But anyway, he eventually died from that after several years of going downhill. But it was pretty much determined that it was because of the um, pick, eating the morels for years and years. The, uh, no, specifically the morels in apple orchards, right? In apple orchards, correct. That's, right. That's why I test the soil in my apple tree places. I test for lead. The, yeah, lead and arsenic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. lead arsenic. I figure arsenic is difficult to test for. You have to send out to a lab and it costs about 40 well, bucks a shot. Um, years ago, we were lucky enough to have Gene Barney in the club. And he, uh, he knew that the pesticide of choice from like 1850 to like 1950 or something. 60, 1960 something actually. Led to lead and arsenic. Yeah. And mushrooms are very subject to picking up um, um, heavy metals from the soil. Yep. So, so I, that's I, why you, you shouldn't you can, pick any kind of edible within about 20 feet of a major road. Yep. That's another, another thing. Yep. But I, in my local apple orchards, that's why I mentioned they were mostly small little adjunct things to dairy farms. 
Because yeah. my my idea is that they probably didn't use a lot of pesticides in those in those places. Well, I used to I used I used to eat a few morels if I found them under apple trees. I can only think of one site offhand at the minute, but I it, not like Bob. I mean, he consumed day after day after day, year after year under uh, his favorite pastime. Jim uh, Richards could probably tell you more about that. Right. What? Well, but I did I did test soil and some morel mushroom material that I, you know, pretty much soaked in water. I tested for lead. It's not that difficult to test for lead. So my idea is that since the pesticide was lead arsenate, you're either going to have both of those substances present or neither in, you know, in sufficiently um, uh, large amounts to, to warrant uh, concern. So, so I test for lead because you can test for it. You can buy a lead test kit that'll, that'll give you like a dozen or so applications for maybe 30 or $40. Whereas to test for arsenic, you have to send out to a lab and it's $30, $40 for one test. That was that, in fact, that was 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, now it's probably more. So that's why I mentioned about testing for lead uh, earlier. And I, I probably should have explained a little more thoroughly, but you have picked up the ball there. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks, Susan and Dave. Okay, so I'm gonna go into, I have a few here. Um, these aren't necessarily my favorite, favorite edibles, but they're like really good edibles. I wanted to pick out ones that probably weren't gonna be shown. Um, I'll start with this one, this agaricus. Um, so this is a, big, I guess this is what they call a horse mushroom, right? Um, I called it, when I found it, I was calling it originally arvensis, arg, um, agaricus arvensis. But when I looked into it a little bit more, I was using the um, that book by Richard Kerrigan. And uh, he has another name in there that I think might be more appropriate, fissuratus. Agaricus fissuratus. Yeah, there's also crocodilinus. Yeah, well, I went with fissuratus on this one because of, um, why did I go with that one? Um, because of the distinct yellow cast of the cap. And my, my photos are a little washed out here, unfortunately. Um, there was a distinct yellowish cast to this and the larger dimensions. So these were pretty big. These were like six to seven inches across here. They were huge. So I found this in a grassy area underneath the pin oaks. Although I don't know if the pin oak really had anything to do with that. I think mm. it was just more the grass, right? So these agaricus are pretty closely related to the, the white button mushrooms that we find in the same genus. The, the white button mushrooms, I mean, sorry, that you buy in the grocery store. Um, meadow mushroom, I think they're related. To, I think a meadow mushroom is a different species of this, like campestris or something. Um, they call these horse D mushrooms. Different section of genus agaricus. Metal mushrooms. Yes, that's a huge. Yeah, these genus. big guys are section arvenses. Arvenses, right? So if you look at it, it's got this really thick veil, really heavy duty veil on it, and uh, you know they're they're just massive, and they were they fried up really nicely, golden yellow. And so like a test our piece here. So when I say I always whenever I try a new mushroom, I always just fry them up in just a little bit of oil, with just a little bit of salt on them. And I just do a, a taste test to make sure it tastes good, make sure I'm going to tolerate it pretty well. And I got to say, these were one of the best mushrooms I've ever eaten. Unfortunately, I just do not find them very much. Rarely do I ever find them. But, Look, I found some by me, but they have like a different annulus. That, it's almost like a cogwheel. Cogwheel is what it's usually described as. Yeah. These, you know, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, they, they this might end, have ended up with a cogwheel type annulus they weren't really broken off I feel, like i said my photographs were a little washed out here so they're delicious though i don't find them all the time but in august uh after a wet spell sometimes i do same area august september sometimes i find them in spring rarely may rarely hmm. these make the best stuffed mushroom caps oh, oh I bet. yeah i bet <laughs> yeah they were fabulous and this is the book um that i was using for it. This 
it's a map and this book's going to set you back i don't know it's like 100 bucks or something and it's this is recyclable mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge book a lot, um, a but it's pretty good so <laughs> so yeah yeah i know you know it, it says uh, meadows that are not treated with pesticides or fertilizer you know that just goes with any mushrooms that you're collecting you gotta know where you're collecting from um you know yeah, yeah, you, uh, you, you, what do you, you like to stuff them with? Oh, um, well, that you can do crab. You can just do um, a bread stuffing, and you and you chop up the stem, and you know, and use like onions and other sorts of um, um, veggies. You know, maybe yeah, maybe a little think, garlic. I mean, think, you can use your imagination, think, really. Yeah, think anything that you would stuff a portobello with. Well, these, yeah. these are not really that far off yeah. from a portobello, to be honest with you. So, I'm going to yeah. um, I'm going to take a second here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, yeah, it's, it's I'm going sort to go, of like the uh, shapes of the caps that are really make make them great for stuffing. Give me a second, tend Dave. To give, give me a second. Pretty I'm, convex. I need I need to mute everyone, and then you can unmute yourself. Okay, it's too much background noise. <laughs> So just a reminder to everyone, if when you're done speaking, to please mute yourself again so it doesn't get uh, overloaded with uh, sounds. All right. So anyway, you were saying, Dave? Oh, uh, the, the, those big horse mushrooms, before they completely expand, it's really the shape of the cap and how meaty the caps are that make them so great for stuffing. Uh, because they, you can put a lot of stuff in inside one of these caps. Yeah. All right. So, so anyway, that's that's one of my favorites. I'm going to move on because there's I know there's two more people that want to share. Okay. Um, this one, you know, it's funny. I think um, Liz kind of mentioned touched on this. These ones that are really good edibles, I often forget to actually make observations of them. And this one, Brusilla Maria, um, or Marii, I guess that's how you say it, Marii. Um, I couldn't find a single photograph of an observation of my own, but yet they're one of my favorites. So I, I put this link in here for Mushroom Expert. So these are these purple, usually purple brucellas that you find um, in the hardwood forest. It says here under oaks. Um, usually they're purple, but sometimes they have like these greenish and yellow tones to them, to the caps. You can see this one's like a little more lavender, but what makes them really distinct are these purple stems. See how the stem is purple on here? Michael Crow's photographs are never very good. You see how grainy they are. Um, but, uh, and sometimes they say that the, the gills, well actually they start out white and they go a little bit cream, but sometimes the gills, we even have a little bit of a pinkish tone to them from touching the stem from before they expanded. Um, and I find these, I find these up in the mountains, like kind of up in like mid-state Pennsylvania when I go camping. So the only, the, the only picture I could find of these in my entire mushroom collection, I've got thousands and thousands of pictures with these two photographs <laughs> taken in a saute pan from a campsite. So, but they're really good. I fried them up like real crisp, probably with garlic powder. So I was camping, so I'm kind of like going light. Um, hmm. Garlic powder, salt and pepper, and like just get them like really nice and crispy and eat them up like that. And I do the same thing with the green russulas. So all the green russulas that I find um, out there, I um, cook them the same way, just like saute them up and get them like crispy, like a potato chip. But yeah. Luke, these, these Moreas, I never find more than like one at a time. They're really beautiful, but um, hardly worth taking home one. Yeah, that, unfortunately, really unfortunately around here where I live in Philadelphia, it's, just, it's the same. Thing. I only ever find one or two, but when I go camping, off, this was near Knobles. If anybody knew, that's actually where I was camping. It was at Knobles in Pennsylvania. So and not far from where I live. Yeah, from Bloomsburg. And I just went out hiking somewhere, like some local state game lands around there. And I picked just loads and loads of them up there. Yeah, I, I find these. I find these in mixed woods or maybe maybe mostly oak. They're, they are good. I like them. Yeah. And um, they don't, one thing that, these are different from the Xerantholina types, which are also really good edibles, but even more rare, what pretty rare actually. The Xerantholinas are kind of rare up around here. These don't, these don't bruise. There's no brown bruising on them. 
Uh, and they have kind of this distinctive odor too. Do you notice that, Luke? It's like this distinct. It's not. It's a sort of subtle. Yeah, I guess um, so. You know, I usually do give them a good smell when I pick them up. I wouldn't be able to describe it as anything other than mushroomy, but I guess they are kind of unique. Yeah, they they grow in my yard <laughs> by by a hickory tree. You know, not a whole lot of them. Maybe I can get four. You know, when at a really you know at a, yeah when there's a lot of them. But I can go up to Ricketts Glen and pick these sometimes yeah. and maybe, maybe get like a small bag full. If anybody ever notices on the email that I send out, there's a, a watercolor down at the bottom by uh, Bernice Fado. Her husband was Ray Fado, who was the uh, Rusula expert of New Jersey, who actually put out the Rusula book that we use. Um, but anyway, the, the watercolor that's in there is the species. So next time you see an email come from me, look for that. Um, Dave, how do you tell the, how do you distinguish the Zerampolina rusulas? Odor, smell. shrimpy, crabby, slice the gills a little bit, you'll get a brown stain on the slice, rub the stalk, you get a brown stain, and the stalk is somewhat textured. There's a few different ones, there's like a green one, um, greenish grayish one that's Eleides. I hardly ever find it. There's a there's a red one that looks pretty much like classic Xerampolina, maybe a little more red than purple. Uh, it's probably an undescribed species. Uh, but then there's one called Barley, Rusula Barley. That's the one I find most often. I have one or two spots where I can get a bag, a little small, you know, like a sandwich, uh, paper sandwich bag of those once in a while they're really good those are orange yellowish orange orange but they all share those common traits the odor and the brown bruising do is somebody in the club have uh, reprinted versions of the uh, kiwi fado key i think uh, i don't know about reprinted i know i think i think the burkharts have a few copies of them um i've got a anybody? copy well i know a lot of us have it but uh, it, but you can go. You can go online if you Google it. You'll find it online. I think um, Bart Buick, who does a lot of Russell work uh, on his website, Russell News, right? He, he has an online key that's based on that. Right. He, he Nina and John have a few copies left of that. Not too many, but I kind of like the old one. I like looking through it. Right. It's nice. And at the end, they have some interesting ones that aren't really fully described yet. I, I find that's right. really useful. That has well, I, been that's the a, case. I always get discouraged trying to do that. I go through the whole thing and then I get three or four that sort of match and I'm not really sure. So uh, you will never be sure with Russell as a lot of them. Yeah. That's what people tell me. So that's why I'm interested that Dave knows he found Barley and Zerampolinas because- Yeah, well, those, are, <laughs> those have pretty distinctive traits, mm -hmm. but in general, the the colorful russulas with the cuticles that peel, if you can narrow it down to three or four, that's actually pretty yeah. good. Yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> and none yeah, of them are poisonous. Some of them might be hot and peppery or bitter, but yeah, not- Yeah, taste too. Yep, yep. The Zerampolina types, they taste good too. I mean, that's another mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Okay, let me do my last Thanks. one because we're getting close to the end. I know there's still two more people I want to share. Okay, so this is probably my favorite mushroom of all time, I think. I think it's hard to say, right? <laughs> Boletus arpes. If nothing else, it's one of my most favorite to find because they're not that common around here. Um, but this is one of the, it's a bolete. Um, it's actually in a different genus now, Igor told me. Well, I forget the name of the new genus he told me. It's a Chinese name. Um, but these things are bright yellow. Like they say, they have this cap on them, this like velvety brown cap. And the undersides of them, the pores and the stipe are this bright yellow. And it's got this nice reticulation on them. And this is one of the fewer bolites that I, I'm able to collect that actually usually tastes pretty good when it's fresh. Not, I shouldn't say taste. Um, texturally, it's pretty good when they're fresh because they're so firm. So these are about as big as I would let them get and still eat them fresh. Otherwise, they go straight to the dryer. Um, but I will saute these up on their own while they're still fresh and eat them. And uh, the texture is pretty decent on them. They're really heavy, aren't they? 
Yeah, he they're super it's heavy weird. and dense. The first time I found one, I'm like, what is, what is this? Yep, and I find these um, in hardwoods. I think beech. It's always beech and oak is a mixed beech and oak woods where I find them, but it seems like they're more, a little closer associated with the beach, as far as I can tell. But I guess you never really know in these mixed forests. The here. one spot where I, f I find them, and only every few years, is, is an open area, like a mowed lawn area, and but but it's oaks. Oaks, okay. Yeah, the, the areas I find are a mixed open beach. Um, and I often, I usually, when I'm finding these, I'm also finding like Boletus nobilis and Boletus separans. So usually I find them in much more bigger quantities. Like I'll come out with like, you know, a grocery bag full of separans and nobilis and, you know, three or six of these. So all those nobilis and separans, they all go in the dryers and these things get cooked right up. So. What's your tolerance for bugs? Uh, pretty high, <laughs> pretty high. I don't mind bugs too much. That's you what know. I thought. Yeah, these don't get buggy though, do they? Yes, they do. All bow leads get buggy. Yeah, you know, so the ones, so what? the ones I found, don't get real buggy because they're so dense. Yeah, you know, and one thing I do too, I take, I usually refrigerate them overnight before I uh, do anything with them, and I find the the cold I think shocks the the bugs and often drives a lot of them out. So, but I, I'm not too worried about them. If I cut them open and I see a lot of them writhing around in there. I might toss it, but if I just see the the, bur the holes, I think those insects are gone anyway. They've already pupated and flown away. So. What was the species name for this again? This is Boletus aripes. Here, I'll, I'll go back to it. Um, and like I said, there's a new genus, as is all things Bolete, but this name will still get you there. Absolutely no staining or bruising on these, right, Luke? No. Nope. So, okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so we have two more people, Bianca, and then Timur asked to go last. So Bianca, if you'd like to show us your, your find. I would love to. I've been waiting for this day to show you guys this find. I'm so thrilled about it. Let me see if I can get this open. All right. It is so much fun to find them, isn't it? It's it's exciting. I don't tell people my spots, but I give them mushrooms because sometimes I have too many. It's a treasure hunt or an Easter egg hunt. It sure yeah. is. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, my dad was a flea market hunter and that's where I got it from. So, but yes, so you can't really tell from the size from this, but this is a, I actually saw this from the road. This is actually a little bit on the hill. Let me see if I have a picture. No, I think it's down further. Let's see if I can go. All right. So this is looking down on it. This is what I saw uh, probably like uh, 20 feet from the road. I was driving by to a dog park. And, and so I was like, that was bright orange. There's no way. And so I went and found it. And this was the stash. You can't see size yet with this. So there's two grocery bags full and I left some. Uh, and that's size of a piece of it with my hand. <laughs> if it gives you any indication of how much. So I weighed what I took and it was 14 pounds of chicken of the woods from that one location. And then I, uh, I have this, this uh, griddle. So I was flipping it in the middle of flipping it. I just love the color. So I wanted to show that. And yeah, I, I, it took me like four batches to, to griddle all of it. So you see the oil and salt next to the, um, next to the griddle and butter uh, is what I used. And then I made it into almost like a chicken Alfredo with spinach. Uh, oh, that's not it. That was it. That's all I have there. Um, but I found several different stashes of this. Um, one was in the, the area that I go in that's right in my neighborhood, which I've apparently found more mushrooms than I expected to. One of which was on a huge fallen, I, I want to say it couldn't have, I wanted to say it's an oak, but it was just enormous. I don't know if, if um, chicken in the woods grows on oak. Um, okay. Just trying to yeah, okay. So it was this enormous, I couldn't, I, I want to say diameter of maybe like 
three and a half, four feet um, that had fallen. And just, it. I watched it grow. It was these little bulbs on there. And then I saw this, this growing. But I have a, a tiny story to add to this. The first time I actually had, uh, we were going to try the, what we thought was the chicken of the woods. We didn't do fully our research because as we all know, chicken of the woods has pores, not gills. And the only look alike is what we found, Jeff, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And luckily, just before I had started frying them, because I had cleaned them, debugged them, and he's my, my fiance is like, let me do just one more check. He looked online for lookalikes. And sure enough, he said, Bianca, turn off the lights and it glowed blue green. And we're like, well, that was cool, but we're not gonna eat this anymore. So that's my share. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks Bianca. Yeah, you gotta be careful. You gotta really do your research before you eat any of these things, right? So, okay, uh, Tamor, did you wanna share? You asked to go last. Ah, uh, yeah, I have uh, two samples. So let's take a look here. While he's getting the shares up, I wanted to ask how people normally, like with the chicken of the woods, now that I have like five different locations that I find it, I wanted to ask, what's the best way of debugging that one? Do you soak it in water? Do you soak it in a different uh, material? I never really feel like they're very buggy, the ones I find. Besides, you know, besides a few random like beetles and stuff that might be in there, those I just brush off. Yeah, when I soaked the ones that I had, a lot of these black beetles were uh, clamoring up for air. There were a lot of them in there. Yeah, those I think you could just kind of, if you just peel them apart and just kind of wash them off and brush them off. I actually keep a little Tupperware container next to my sink and I put all the bugs in them and then I dump them out my window. But I'm also a, uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for arthropods. <laughs> so it seems like, uh... Uh, the software here isn't cooperating with with, uh, with my uh, operating system. I was going to show you guys uh, the uh, chicken, chicken of uh, chicken of the woods, and the chaga mushroom, um, but uh, it's just it's not coming up. So instead, I'd like to ask uh, if you can uh, maybe offer some advice about uh, where I could uh, locate uh, seasonal uh, seasonal charts or seasonal uh, calendars for edible mushrooms in the Northeast. Uh, I've uh, looked all over the internet and I've tried to focus in because now we're in ending in the winter season uh, to see, you know, basically when enoki and oyster and these kinds of things uh, grow. But mostly uh, my results came up with uh, Pacific Northeast uh, or the uh, or the, uh, the Western coast. So nothing really in the Northeast. I would say um, that Bill Russell book um i don't know the exact name of it. i'll put it in the chat bill russell mushrooms of pennsylvania yeah. and i think and the maybe and the appalachian region or something yeah. but um but but see pinning down mushrooms seasonally in eastern north america is much more difficult than mm -hmm. to do the same thing in the pacific northwest in the pacific northwest they have basically a mushroom season that rolls in with the fall rains and persists into the winter. In the East, we have even the Bill Russell book. Okay, it, it claims to be based on seasons, spring, uh, summer, fall, winter. But some of the mushrooms that Bill Russell will say are late spring or summer mushrooms might also be found in the fall. And some of the mushrooms he says that are found in the fall may also be found in the late spring. Um, the reason for that is that we weather and temperature is a little bit more variable from year to year um, in Eastern North America than apparently it is out, out West. 
Um, so there's quite a few mushrooms that we have here in the East that are split, so-called split season, like Boletus sedulus will come out in late June and then it'll come out again in September, October. And with sometimes a few, you'll see a few in between. Um, same thing with chicken mushroom. Sometimes it will come out in, in late June, sometimes in the fall, and occasionally you'll see it in between. Uh, a lot of mushrooms are. Now, some mushrooms are strictly seasonal, like morels are spring. Bluets are fall. Um, but it's difficult to pin down um, all of the good edible Eastern North American mushrooms to, to a, a given season. And that's probably why we're having trouble finding mm -hmm. um, definitive information yeah. that, that correlates se season with species. Yeah, I noticed uh, as far as the calendars go for our area, uh, Michigan gets a lot of attention. Uh, I found several calendars for that particular state and that might be because of its proximity to the lakes region. So. I would, I would definitely though, Timur, check out that book that I recommended. Penny put the name of it in there because he separates everything out by the season. And, mm. you know, like Dave was saying, you got to take it with, you know, you got to take it in stride. It's not an exact science, but he does spring, summer, fall, and winter. And he focuses a lot on edibles, not all edibles, but he's yeah, definitely. I, I understand. Um, I have like, two, ref two references here. One is from USDA. The other one is the Audubon Society book. And for each of the mushrooms, they do specify the seasonal range. But what I'm really looking at, looking for is for a kind of um, just a one-stop source, you know, whatever month I find myself to be in at the moment. I, I don't like think there is one. No, there's no one-stop source for any one. mushrooms. <laughs> you know, yeah, you especially not in Eastern North America. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, gonna build a, you're gonna build a library. <laughs> Dan, why don't you make it? <laughs> you might want to approach it a little differently. And that is, learn 15 or 20 edible mushrooms really well. So mm -hmm. wherever you are at any time you know them, mm -hmm. whether you read it, whether you look at pictures, whatever, spend a lot of time with the club. Um, they're gonna be doing forays so that it, it's a lot of legwork. You, you, have to, you have to be able to know what it is when you see it. Um, and you can only do that by repetition over and over again. But if you start with like 15 or 20 species that you want to find, if you're going out looking for edible mushrooms, you won't find them. But if you're out in the woods to enjoy the woods because it's a nice day or you need a hike, then you may stumble across something. And rather than say, what is this? Either have your little reference with you or, or your internet connection or whatever. Um, that you've learned it yourself. Mm -hmm. I would also say learn the poisonous ones first because there's yes. fewer poisonous That's ones than there are say, edibles. I mean, spend, if you spend time with the club, you'll learn the poisonous look at likes at the same time. Yeah, what I like mostly, uh, uh, what I like about uh, most of these references for mushrooms is that uh, in describing the edible mushroom, they will dedicate maybe a few lines of text to a poison look alike. So that's really good. Yeah, well, that's important, you know. Yeah, I mean, one, one advantage for a winter uh, foraging is that uh, there aren't really that many uh, poisonous lookalikes if we're talking about oyster and enoki. I would watch out for the gallerinas. Yeah, gallerina marginata, well, you can find that virtually any month starting in September and up through most of May. Oh. So those those fruit despite a frost, a winter frost. Yeah, they like that. They like that cool weather. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're they're saprobic, so they don't need to have a tree actively supplying nutrients. They're they're just whenever the weather conditions are appropriate, um, the mycelium will go into action and and start feeding off dead wood. Yeah, and make mushrooms. But I'm thinking that uh, if a frost comes along, uh, does the is a deadly galleria, does it have that particular uh, anti-frost chemical in it as much as the- Oh, I don't know, maybe. 
Because if it doesn't, it'll just freeze, and then once it uh, defrosts, it'll spoil. It'll be obvious that. You know. Well, the mushrooms will, but but the mycelium stays in the substrate. Okay. And and is reactivated by, uh, is, you know, favorable weather conditions. Mm. So I'm, we're gonna, we need to wrap up here. I would like to add, uh, based on what Sue very put very well, um, is you really need to learn you know, more than just the edibles. Like, so if you're looking for the Enochis, you really need to learn how to f identify the Gallerinas too. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's, I would say, that's something that's always been stressed to me over and over again by people who have a lot more knowledge than me, you know, in this club. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, especially if you're picking the, um, if you're looking for the Enochis in winter or spring, because Gallerinas come out then. Um, earlier in the fall, you also need to be aware of foliotas and hyphalomas and, you know, a few other things that might not be, some, some of them might be a little bit toxic and, and some of them might not be, but, but, but you always want to know what it is that you're bringing home to eat. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell people, take your time. You know, you're going to see this stuff again. It's not like when you find an Enoki, it's the only time in your life you're ever going to find it. You know, if you're really into this, you're going to find yourself doing it year after year. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's better to slow, to, you know, take it slowly and do it the right way. Mm. You don't want to have an accident with some of these things. Mm -hmm. So well, anyway, this is, it's nine o'clock now. Um, I do need to wrap it up. Thank you everyone for coming. I hope everyone enjoyed this tonight. Um, we will be doing again in a couple of weeks. So there's a lot of interest in morels. There's always a lot of interest in that. We will have a, uh, another taxonomy Tuesday, um, late March or early May. I forget exactly when we're going to dedicate it more towards morels and those types of ascos that we'll be finding. So I think with a little more focus on actually hunting those, so we will be getting back to all of them. Next week, Taxonomy Tuesday is polypores. I'm going to do an introduction to polypores. Um, I'm gonna think, I think what I'm going to do is more of an introduction to identification of polypores, because polypores is a huge, huge group of mushrooms that encompass a number of families. And it's way more than we could probably uh, accomplish in like the 10 or 15 minutes I dedicate in the beginning. But I will go over a, um, an introduction to trying to identify polypores, which is a, uh, a, 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 it can be quite a task to do that. So um, don't forget this Friday, we have Tom Porton and then we'll see, see everyone next Tuesday, right? Luke, can I ask you a question about the website you mentioned? You said there's going to be a new website with yes. the recipe on it. Was that a new website of the NGMA? Or... Yeah, the, okay. New Jer the New Jersey Club is revamping the website. Um, so it's not up yet. You won't be able to find it yet, um, but it's being rewritten and we're adding a bunch of stuff to it. Um, okay. Hoping for May. We're hoping to get it out by May. But I know I got that one, that one porcini maitake recipe. That one made the cut. I know it's on there. Great. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. So, all right. We'll see everyone next week. All right. Have a great week, Thank everyone. You guys. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. That was fun. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.